This instructional video will detail the entire initial programming process on a videofied WIP630 system. We'll begin by inserting the SIM card into the panel, and then we're going to power the unit by connecting the rechargeable lithium battery and the power supply. Next, I'm going to insert the batteries into the keypad and wait for the audible double beep. To learn the keypad into the panel, begin by pressing the init button once, followed by a single simultaneous press of the escape no and clear buttons on the keypad. Once the keypad displays keypad 1 recorded, press the OK button to enter initial programming. So at this point, I've already mounted the keypad's back cover directly to the wall. Keep in mind that this section is the most important here, as this is the tamper breakaway. In other words, if an intruder were to forcibly tear this keypad from the wall, this section would break off and the panel would immediately transmit a tamper alarm. So I'm going to close up the keypad at this time. Be sure to align the markers on both sides of the keypad with the top markers on the cover, here and here. Once aligned, simply slide the keypad downward so that it locks into place with the back cover. I'm now ready to continue on through initial programming. And I'm going to select the language first by pressing OK. Now this is prompting us to radio range test this keypad. It is always important to initiate this test, so I'm going to press OK here. And the function of this test is to measure the RF performance or range between this device and the panel by sending data packets bidirectionally. So this should climb to 9 of 9 and continue to hold at 9 of 9 for approximately 20 seconds. Press OK when you're ready to stop the test, and then press the No button when prompted with radio range test again to move forward with programming. It's now prompting us to create the first code on this system, which is a 4 to 6 digit installer code. For this demonstration, I will use 4321. Confirm the code. And next we can assign a name to the code. So for this code, I'm simply going to call it installer. And once I've entered the name completely, I can press OK to move forward in programming. Next is the time and date setting. Press OK to enter this parameter. And there will be two options available, auto and manual. Manual is self-explanatory, whereas auto allows us to select a UTC time zone. Since we're here on central time, I'm going to select UTC negative 6 and press OK. Now I can scroll to the corresponding subzone, which should be central US slash Canada, and I can press OK to continue. This brings us to the monitoring section of programming. Now, you'll always want to press OK on connecting to monitor station, since this will allow us to enter the necessary information for our monitoring station. This brings us to the account number. And here we can enter the corresponding account number supplied by your central station. In this example, I'm going to use 9999, then I'm going to press OK to save that parameter. Next, we can configure the periodic test setting starting with the frequency of transmission, and 24-hour reporting is standard, so press OK to confirm the setting. Now we need to configure the test's report time, starting with the test hour, and we'll use the arrow keys here to scroll to the desired hour. Press OK, and then adjust the minutes, and press OK again to accept the selection. Now the event state modification option provides us with the ability to toggle individual event reporting and restorals on the system for things such as tampers, low batteries, arm and disarm events, etc. All standard events will come pre-configured by default, so I'll press no here to bypass this option. Now we can enter the server address information for the monitoring station starting with the primary IP or domain. Press OK to enter the menu and then press OK to begin typing the IP address. For this example, we are using the videofied IP address. Once the IP has been entered, Press OK to save the parameter. Press Escape No to exit the menu, and then Escape No again on server addresses to move forward. 
So I've completed entering the monitoring station server address information, and now I can configure the system's communication paths, starting with cellular. For this demonstration, I want to enable cellular communication, so I'm going to press OK here. Next, press OK to enter this menu to input the APN code, which corresponds with the type of SIM card installed in the panel. Press OK to confirm the setting. And then Escape No again to move forward. So now that I've completed entering the APN code, we can now test the cellular signal of the panel. Press OK to initiate the test. And just keep in mind that this test will typically take approximately 15 to 30 seconds to return a result. And we've received our result a 4 of 5, which is more than sufficient. Press Escape No here to move forward in programming. Next, we can define the Ethernet communication path parameters. For this demonstration, I want to enable Ethernet, so I'm going to press OK here. So since we've enabled Ethernet communication on the system, Ethernet parameters allows the user to define the settings. Note that the system will automatically connect to a local network via DHCP, and therefore there shouldn't be anything I need to configure in this menu for this demonstration, so I can skip over it using the No button. Now, Ethernet status will allow us to confirm the panel has established the connection on the local network by returning the local IP address which has been assigned to the panel. Press OK to initiate the test, and that result right there is our confirmation. So I can press OK to acknowledge the result, followed by Escape No on the Ethernet status question to exit and move forward in programming. This next section allows us to specify a custom name for each of the four areas on our system. Since I don't want to enter custom names for each area at this time, I can simply press Escape No to keep the default names. Now we can configure our exit delay, and the minimum is 45 seconds. But if I scroll the options here, you can see that we can select one minute and a maximum of two minutes. For this example, I will select 45 seconds. Next, we can set up our entry delay. So you'll see the various options as I scroll through. 15 second, 30 second, 45 second, one minute, and a maximum of two minutes, just like we saw on our exit delay. But again, for this example, I'm going to select 45 seconds to match the exit delay. And this brings us to the next section where we can finally begin to enroll additional devices into the system. Because the screen is already stating press program button of device, I can grab my first device, which is an indoor motion viewer, and I'm going to press its enroll button, as demonstrated, to learn it into this system. So here we've received confirmation that the motion viewer has been accepted into the system. Take note that while we just enrolled the first motion viewer, it is important to understand that the first device enrolled into this system was the keypad. Therefore, the keypad is occupying zone number one, and this first motion viewer is now occupying zone number two. So with that stated, I can press OK to proceed into the device setup process. Next up is the radio range test. And remember, this option allows us to range test this device exactly as I demonstrated earlier with the keypad after beginning initial programming. So again, I can press OK to initiate the test, and you'll be able to observe a blinking LED as shown on the device's PIR lens as the number out of nine climbs for every successful ping the device has received during the range test. To end the test, press OK, followed by a press on the No button to skip over the radio range test question screen and move forward in programming. This second option allows us to define the behavior of the device by placing it into an area. And since I want this device to trigger instantly once the system is armed for this example, I'm going to select Area 2. 
Next, I can assign a name to this device. And typically, you want to assign a name based on what this device is protecting. For this example, I'm going to call this front hall. And once I've completed entering the name, I can press OK to save the name. Which leads us to the final step in the device enrollment process called functional device test. And this will test the function of the PIR sensor on the motion viewer. Press OK to initiate the test. So as you can see demonstrated here, as I wave my hand in front of the device, the LED indicator confirms that the device's motion sensor is functioning properly. Press OK to end the test. So now that we've completed the setup process for the motion viewer, we can enroll another device in the system. So this next device is a door contact that I have. I'm going to press the enroll button on it as shown. And again, this screen, contact one recorded, confirms that the device has been accepted into the system. Press OK. And again, I want to range test this device as well. Press OK to initiate the test. And just like we saw with the indoor motion viewer, the LED is flashing once for every successfully received ping. After the result has held steady at 9 of 9 for about 20 seconds, press OK to end the test. And then again, press No to move past radio range test. And for this device, I want it to be subject to the system-wide entry and exit delays, so I'm going to select Area 1. And because this is a door window sensor, it will prompt us by default to configure this sensor as a perimeter device. So I'm going to say yes to this option by pressing OK. Next, I want to assign a name to this device as well, and I'm going to call this one Front Door. And again, the final enrollment step is the functional device test. Keep in mind that this test is essential when it comes to door contacts, as it will determine the normal state of the device. So before initiating the test, ensure the read switch and magnet are aligned properly. And then press OK to initiate the test. Separating the magnet from the read switch will cause the device's LED to illuminate while in an open state. And the LED will turn off when the device is in its closed state. Finally, press OK to end the test. And we're now seeing the prompt to enroll another device. But because I don't have another device to enroll at this time, I'm going to press no here. So the reason why we're seeing the badge entered prompt here is because the system has actually detected a badge reader is present. And it's asking if we'd like to enroll a badge at this time, which I do. So I can press OK here. So here's my video five badge. And I'm going to present it to the badge reader. Note the green LED, and now we can assign a name to this badge. In this example, I don't want to enter a custom name, so I'm simply going to press OK, and the badge will assume a generic access name and number. That's all there is to it to enroll a badge into the system. And I'm going to press No here since I'm not planning to enroll any other badges at this time. And this leads us to the one final important step, which requires that we place the cover on the panel so that the tamper is secure. Once that step has been completed, take note of the Operation Completed display. It is important at this final stage to ensure that there are not any open devices as the panel will run a systems check after pressing the OK button here. If there are any faults found, such as an open tamper during this check, it will temporarily stop completion of the initial programming process until all faults have been addressed. For our purposes here, I've ensured that all devices are secure and I can press OK. Finally, look for the Installation Successful Status Display and then the Ready to Arm Home screen. This will indicate initial programming has now been completed, which brings us to the conclusion of this instructional video.